The Indy Lounge is brought to you by Flightline Financial, pilots helping pilots with their financial needs. Lexard Capital Management, a real estate private equity firm. And Lighten Up Salon and Spa of Mount Olive, New Jersey. Welcome to the Indy Lounge. I'm your host, Mandy Del Rio. We have a fantastic show lined up for you today. My guest is David Bruno. David is a criminal defense attorney, former assistant prosecutor, national TV analyst, and partner at the Bianchi Law Group in West Caldwell, New Jersey. Hi, David. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Mandy. Absolutely. Um, so you've done so many things. Um, now let's start from the beginning and when you got started with your legal career. Well, I attended the I, Seton Hall University first. It was a business finance degree. And I never even thought I was going to be going into the law. Hmm. But I had a, a good mentor that really put me and focused me into the criminal aspect of it. Um, went to New York law, uh, law School, okay, so Seton Hall, New York Law School, and I graduated. And there weren't many jobs, uh, really. I had a mentor that really took me under his wing, and I worked as a criminal defense attorney first. Oh, so wow. believe it or not, I've been criminal defense attorney, prosecutor, criminal defense attorney. Oh, wow. Um, but after about a year of being a criminal defense attorney, I met my now partner, Robert Bianchi, uh, a doctor who was charged in federal court with prescribing uh, controls dangerous substances, uh, retained myself and Robert Bianchi's firm. Oh, wow. And that's when we just met. Um, I had a very limited time to work with him, and then little did I know he was going to become the head Morris County prosecutor. Wow. And the relevance to that is I actually grew up in Morris County. Mm -hmm. I grew up in Randolph. I had lived there my entire career. And now somebody that I knew became the head county prosecutor. And that's an appointment by the governor. Governor John Corzine nominated him. He was confirmed by the Senate. And he gave me a call and said, listen, if you're interested, there's an opening here. You'll have to go through the process. That's amazing. Which I did. So yeah, 2007, um, I'm 26 years old at the time, I joined the Morris County Prosecutor's Office as an assistant prosecutor. Wow. I was there about six years. I left in 2013. And now I am in private practice with my partner, Robert Bianchi, uh, at the Bianchi Law Group in West Caldwell where we specialize in criminal defense, we handle cases in municipal court, and we're in the state and federal courts in criminal defense. Wow, that's great. Um, now, so you've been, like you said, on both sides of the spectrum here legally. Sure. Um, and you know, I know as far as when you first started out, what kind of cases were you defending when you first started as a defense attorney? Uh, all kinds of cases. I okay. mean, I was, I was with a very experienced former prosecutor right, as well, right. okay. and, and he had a high-end clientele, and we had state and federal court cases. So it was very, very interesting to learn from a former prosecutor, even when I just started as mm -hmm. a defense attorney, mm -hmm. because that's important. In the criminal world, attorneys who have prosecutorial experience really do understand the process to be able to effectively represent defendants charged with crimes. Yeah, that was actually my next question. How has that helped you being a, you know, how did it help you, um, you know, your current work as a defense attorney, mm -hmm. being a prosecuting attorney in between? Sure. How does it, how does it help? How does it Well, there, there are a couple things. Okay. Well, first, uh, when you're a prosecutor, working in a prosecutor's office, you are prosecuting crimes. Mm -hmm. And some cases will start at the local police departments. Those are the most common. A, a police officer maybe pulls a vehicle over and there's a search and there's drugs found in the car. Well, those are the cases where the police officer makes the arrest, writes the report, and then it goes up to the county where an assistant prosecutor will pick up that file and prosecute it. Mm. So I've had experience with those types of cases. There's also units in the office that'll prosecute specific cases like major crimes. Mm. I was a major crimes assistant prosecutor. And that's a little different responsibility because for major crimes, let's say murder, attempted murder, kidnappings, the prosecutor's office will be called in the beginning. Mm. 
Mm. So when a 911 call comes in or a dead body is found, prosecutor's office is called, and I was in the major crimes unit, I would be responsible for going out to the scene wow. and working with the investigators to investigate the case. Yeah. And that would entail getting search warrants and doing interviews and canvassing. Mm -hmm. So I would be the sort of legal eyes on scene. And then, similar to those other cases, I would prosecute it in a courtroom. Mm -hmm. So that experience gives prosecutors a tremendous understanding of the way cases should be investigated and prosecuted. Mm -hmm. Also, for lawyers, it's, it's pretty difficult to get trial experience. Mm -hmm. Either in the civil context, criminal context, most cases resolve. And for a young lawyer, to go out into private practice, it's very difficult to get trial experience because generally speaking, you're in larger firms with more experienced people. Mm -hmm. And historically, more cases would actually go to trial than now. So we're now in an environment where there aren't a lot of trials. Now, why is that exactly? Well, a lot of the laws have changed. Mm -hmm. In the criminal context, there are a lot of different mandatory sentences Mm -hmm. that have made things very difficult to risk a trial. Hmm. Like for example, on, uh, on a gun case, mm -hmm. right? New Jersey's gun laws are second degree crimes. And what that means is somebody could get anywhere from five to 10 years and mandatory parole and eligibility of at least three. Hmm. Okay, so for someone that's charged with a gun crime, for example, there's a tremendous amount of exposure to go to trial, mm. right? The, if found guilty, the judge could sentence somebody up to 10 years. Mm -hmm. So when a defense attorney is representing somebody, there's going to be a negotiation back and forth between the prosecutor. Mm -hmm. And usually prosecutors will give defendants incentives to take resolutions mm. and avoid trial. Gotcha. So for that defendant that could be going to jail for up to 10 years, mm -hmm. and there's a plea offer that could minimize the risk or sign up to get a lower sentence, mm -hmm. that's why most people take deals. Mm. And as these laws change, as the mandatory penalties go up and the risk gets greater, mm -hmm. well, it's a reason for people to take more deals. Mm -hmm. However, the one place where young, where young people could really get trial experience is in the prosecutor's office. Mm. Because while there is a tremendous amount of exposure, you are representing the state or the government. Unlike private practice where you're in a big firm and you have a client mm -hmm. who really wants to experience and creden credentials, mm -hmm. prosecutor's office has people that are very young getting the trial experience. That's interesting. So that was a tremendous place for me to learn mm -hmm. because being in the, pro the major crimes unit mm -hmm. and handling those types of investigations mm -hmm. and getting the trial experience at a very young age allowed me to really take that experience into the private practice and now defend people in my practice. That's great. I mean, that's really interesting. Um, and I'm, I'm curious what goes into you know, when you are a prosecuting attorney or assistant prosecuting attorney, you said you have to go to crime scenes. Right. Um, you actually have to participate in these investigations. Sure, from, from a legal perspective. Right, okay. okay. So um, the detectives and mm -hmm. the investigative staff are mm -hmm. primarily the, the ones searching the house or the rooms. Right, and, they're doing And the engaging in conversation with the target or the defendant. Right. And the lawyers there to navigate the legal issues. You know, for example, if we go to a scene and we need a warrant, right, mm -hmm. a determination needs to be made, well, how are we getting legal access to enter a facility, a residence, automobile, and if the answer is you need a warrant, which generally speaking you do, mm -hmm. well then the lawyer gets involved mm -hmm. and works with the investigator to develop an affidavit of probable cause. Okay. And then we would contact the judge, go to the courthouse or the judge's residence after hours, mm -hmm. and we would meet with a judge who would authorize the warrant. So that would be a part that the lawyer would play at that scene.
Wow. And then similarly, there, there are many times when we had to do interviews of defendants. Mm -hmm. So in that case, there are a number of legal issues uh, that have to be considered. Okay. Uh, defendants who are targets and will be interrogated need to get the Miranda warnings. Mm. Okay, you have the right to remain silent. Oh. Anything mm -hmm. you say can and will be used against you. Right. The, the things that we've all seen on TV but those have to be properly done. Absolutely. So lawyers will be watching, mm -hmm. and I have on many occasions, watching the interview to make sure that the person's constitutional rights were not violated. Okay. Because if they are, well then even admissions and statements made by that, that defendant may be suppressed and not be able to use in trials. Exactly. I mean, there's so much that goes into it. Yeah, yeah so it's I, about doing things right. Absolutely. And I want to talk more about, about that when we come back from our break. We're going to take a short break, but I want to get into the Miranda rights because that's something I want to ask you about. Sure. Um, we are going to take a short break, but please stay with us for more with David Bruno. Welcome back to the Indie Lounge. I'm here with David Bruno. So, David, we we left off um, in, before the break. You were telling me about the Miranda rights. Sure. And I'm really curious how that works because I've heard if you miss the Miranda rights, well, you don't have a criminal, I guess. <laughs> well, that well, that's not true. I okay. Mean, so, Miranda rights are required okay. during criminal investigations when somebody is in custody and interrogated. Mm. Okay. Now, those are two ver those are two legal terms with legal interpretations. But the example that most people are used to is somebody that are, that's brought down to the police station, put in a room, and then you have two detectives come de come into the room and give somebody the Miranda warnings. Okay. So that's a situation where Miranda warnings are required, mm. and the legal issue becomes: Does a defendant understand their rights? and waive their rights. So if somebody gives an admission or a statement in a criminal prosecution and those Miranda rights had to be given, the lawyers will now critique and look at whether or not the, viol the rights were violated. Because it's, it's important because a prosecution with a defendant admitting his guilt is very different than a case with no admission or no statement. Mm -hmm. And now you have to prove things circumstantially and through eyewitnesses. So it's a critical place in an investigation that that was done properly because it could mean the difference between a win or a loss. Wow, wow. And what would you say is more difficult? Uh, just your opinion, prosecuting or defending? And I know they're totally different in many ways. Sure. I mean, as far there... as being difficult, I mean, they, they each have their own issues. I mean, they're, they're very different, but, but I believe in both sides. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've been on both sides, mm -hmm. and the, the system is able to work because of the adversarial system. You have a prosecutor who has the duty to prosecute and prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt to a jury. You have a defense attorney who needs to hold the prosecutor to that burden of proof, all right? And the defendant, every defendant charged with a crime in the United States has a right, right? A right to a lawyer, has a right to a trial. So it, it is absolutely important that we have those two roles in our process so that hopefully we get it right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, what are some of the tougher cases, in your opinion, to prosecute? Yeah, from a prosecutor's, prosecutor's point of view, I would say it's the he said, she said type cases. Mm. All right. For example, the domestic violence cases are, are very difficult because typically these crimes or offenses are happening in the context of the home. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. You may have some witnesses. You may have children that have seen something or you may have no witnesses. Right. And now it is an allegation, either a man or a woman making an allegation that somebody in close relationship has done something to them. Mm -hmm. And I get back to that statement issue. Right. If if a if a defendant has admitted to striking their spouse. 
or doing whatever it is is alleged. That's going to be very different than really having to rely on the victim mm -hmm. to articulate what has happened. And then the lawyer has an opportunity to cross-examine and try to poke holes and make them incredible, mm. right? So those types of cases are difficult because generally they rely on eyewitness testimony of the victim. So there, there are all kinds of different cases, obviously. Mm -hmm. And I just think when there's not supporting evidence, mm -hmm. like in like videos or text mm -hmm. messages or other eyewitnesses, those are very difficult when you don't have the corroborating evidence to really back someone's story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. That does make sense. And I think, um, is fraud something really hard to, you know, there's that challenge? I, I have well, fraud experience. Like okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I have a finance degree. Mm -hmm. uh, I also ha have experience in the fraud unit of the prosecutor's office. Mm -hmm. Now, most of my time was in the major crimes unit, but, mm -hmm. but I have fraud experience. And these fraud cases tend to be paper cases, mm -hmm. okay? So a good fraud investigation really does have the tools in the paper mm. to put it together. Mm -hmm. But the problem becomes these fraud units are probably the most overworked units in all of the offices uh -huh. because of all of the discovery, mm -hmm. all of the paper. Mm -hmm. You can imagine how many pages to, to a substantial fraud oh, a yeah. prosecutor will have to get through. Well, it seems like it's more of an easier crime to do so it's not like you're committing you know homicide or you're hurting somebody or you're, you're committing fraud so yeah, you're doing it more certainly probably more common right right, right out there mm -hmm. um but if if the fraud is played out on paper well then at least you have the 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 evidence to to prosecute true, right true. now not all fraud ca cases are just like that um, there are cases where witnesses still are important mm -hmm. as to maybe conversations mm -hmm. or understandings, mm -hmm. memorandums of understanding, mm -hmm. uh, power of attorneys, mm -hmm. you know, so it's really every type of case ha has different legal issues um, that need to be explored by both sides. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's so interesting. Um, now, I'm... I want to talk more about and get into the more high profile cases. Um, I know we're going to take a break in a minute, but you've you've done um, you actually won an award for one of the the high profile cases that actually kind of hit you personally in a way yeah. um, with the, um, the you know the Jennifer Parks um, sure. trial. Um, now I'm just wondering, you know. Um, what are what are some of the high profile cases you've worked on? Um, you know, like I said, we're going to take a break, but mm -hmm. I want to kind of get into that, and as well as your um, what you do for national TV. I know you're a legal analyst, and I want to get our last segment. I kind of want to get into that as well. Sure. Um, so we are going to take a short break, and when we come back, we um, we'll talk more with David. Stay tuned. And we're back with David Bruno. Um, so our last segment, we started to get into the high profile cases that you've worked on. Um, you received a litigation award for a very important case um, that actually kind of hit you, like I said, personally, because it was in your hometown of sure. Randolph. Yeah. Um, so what do you, what, you want to go into yeah, that? Yeah, I will. Okay. Uh, so when I first got to the office, I was given a tremendous responsibility to try a homicide case. Uh, at 26 years old. And it really hit home for me because this was a case that happened in my hometown. Like I said, I grew up in Randolph. You mm -hmm. know, I was working in the Morris County Prosecutor's Office where I'd lived my whole life. And there was a brutal case that happened the pr in years past where two brothers, the Zarati brothers, Jonathan and James Zarati, killed their 16 year old neighbor. Uh, stabbed her, suffocated her, mm -hmm. and chopped up her body. 
and was caught dumping the body over a bridge. So I was given the responsibility with another assistant prosecutor and we prosecuted those two cases. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, it hit home because grew up there. Um, both defendants were found guilty. They will be serving their entire lives mm -hmm. behind bars in New Jersey State Prison. And the person who nominated me for that litigation award was actually my DARE officer. Oh, so wow. yeah, the chief of police from Randolph in mm -hmm. the department that investigated it mm -hmm. was my DARE officer growing up oh, wow. and that... nominated for the, for the award mm -hmm. and, and I received it and it, it, was, it was great. Wow, wow. Yeah. And that's how, how touching you were on both sides of that and it hit home on, on all you know, aspects of and that. It was a brutal murder as well. Oh, absolutely horrible. Um, yeah. Absolutely horrible. I, I extensively, I remember, um, you know, we'll get into your commentary on the IDs show Deadly Sins. Right. Um, you were on that and I, I did see that episode mm -hmm. and I did look over the case and I, I couldn't help being a parent myself I couldn't help it. I, I get very emotional about this. Yeah, now, is yeah. that something? How do you how do you um, do this without getting an emotional attachment, or do you get an emotional I attachment? I do. I okay. mean, I, I definitely do get an emotional attachment. Okay. You know, like like you said, that that case was profiled on ID Network, mm -hmm. Deadly Sins. Mm -hmm. um, and for all of you that are that are listening to this, check it out because it's a brutal homicide. Yeah. And sure, I, I got emotional. I get emotional. I mm -hmm. think I think that's what makes me as a good lawyer in the courtroom is to feel things. Mm -hmm. Now, it, it can't be to a point where I'm just crying and, right. and out, of, right. out of control, mm -hmm. you know, but, but certainly I could remember uh, the jury coming out and you waiting for the jury and mm -hmm. your heart pumping. I mean, mm -hmm. when you put so much time and effort into a particular case mm -hmm. and it all just comes out to one decision where the jury comes out and the four person reads the verdict, wow. it is a tremendous and emotional experience. I was going to get into that as well, doing, doing the trial. Um, you know, most people, they, they see the trial and they don't know what exactly goes into it. We just know we want to hear guilty or not guilty. We know what we want to, he to hear. So as someone who prosecuted a case, a prosecuting a case, especially one that, you know, such a, as awful as the Jennifer Parks case, it must have been just such a good feeling that justice is being done. Sure. You know, great feeling for the verdict. I mean, it was mm -hmm. the right verdict. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, there's so much that goes into trying a case. Right. It's not just walking into the courtroom at 9 a.m. Mm -hmm. and leaving at 5 p.m. Right. It's leaving the courtroom and then working all night to prepare for the next day. Well, and that starts early. I mean, mm -hmm. luckily, when I was in the major crimes unit, I was involved in the investigation. I learned the case. I lived the case, mm -hmm. right? That that is it starts from day one. That's what I was going to ask you. What goes into it? What goes into trying, prosecuting? You know, what go? What do you? You know, what do you? I was just going to ask you. Is it? I mean, obviously. Yeah. Well, throughout the criminal process, there's discovery. Mm -hmm. um, what, what that is is the defendant is entitled to the documents that the state intends to use mm -hmm. um, and has been generated in a case. So there's a process for every case. Mm -hmm. uh, on the major crimes cases that I was talking about where I was part of the investigation, once somebody's arrested, that's when the court case starts. Mm -hmm. And the defendant will go before a judge and then discovery will have to be exchanged. Mm -hmm. Okay, so throughout that process, the lawyers are working through discovery. Mm -hmm. the, the, a defense attorney will have to s determine whether or not things are missing and need to be supplemented. Mm -hmm. And then the process is basically the judge navigating the court case so that it either resolves by way of a plea or is going to go to trial. Mm. If a case goes to trial, well, there's a tremendous amount of work that has to go into that. Mm -hmm. You know, as a prosecutor, what you'll do is you'll prepare your witnesses, mm -hmm. right? So anybody that you're going to call as a witness is generally going to be brought in, spoken with, reviewed police reports, reviewed whatever it is that that person needs to testify. And it's a time consuming process. Mm -hmm. So prepping witnesses, getting your documents in order, mm -hmm. um, really understanding the facts. 
I mean, to try a case at any point, either in criminal, civil, family, whatever it is, lawyers need to know their cases when they walk into court. Mm -hmm. They need to know dates, names, everything that's in the file. Because that's not the place to not like know things. Right. You right. need to be thinking about other things mm -hmm. when you're on your feet talking to a jury right. or cross-examining or asking questions of a witness. Mm -hmm. You need to know it because you need to really understand what's being done in the courtroom itself Absolutely. and respond appropriately. Absolutely. Um, now, we're almost getting ready to wrap up. But, um, you know, like you said, all of that goes into it and we just see the end. You know, sure. we just see the end. But um, And sometimes it's just the end. Right, you know, right. That, that's okay. another thing. And I know we're going to talk about the TV stuff in a little bit, but I get a little bit frustrated when I see people responding to verdicts mm -hmm. in court cases, mm -hmm. uh, either in the media or elsewhere, mm -hmm. and not knowing what really happened in a courtroom. Right. I right. mean, when a case is tried to a jury, that case is, is operating within the rules of evidence. Mm -hmm. You know, the jurors mm -hmm. are the only people that have, have made decisions strictly based on the evidence. Mm -hmm. And I think it's unfortunate that we could Monday morning quarterback verdicts right. and call into question certain things when the people saying things really don't understand what was presented in a courtroom. Right, right, yeah. Wow, that's interesting. Um, now, we, uh, again, we don't have much time. We actually took up a lot of time with just this case, um, mm -hmm. which is which is fantastic. Sure. But where I know we can see you on Fox News. You right. have been on Fox, and how did you get, just really quickly? How did you get started with doing the Fox News stuff? Well, I, I think it's important that the networks and people that are commenting on mm -hmm. cases in the press do understand both sides. Mm -hmm. So my partner, Bob Bianchi, and I both comment in the national media. It's not mm -hmm. just Fox News, but we are primarily on Fox. Okay. Um, and, it's, and, and what the networks want are two sides to a particular debate. Right. You know, that's what I love about the TV. And, yeah. And it really just highlights that the law is not clear. Mm -hmm. You know, it's about interpretation. So There's mm -hmm. usually two sides to mm -hmm. a particular argument. Mm -hmm. And that's what the networks do. They, they want to bring on debate. Mm -hmm. And that's what we do. We comment. And usually we're debating against some, another lawyer. Right. Or be a right. host. Uh -huh. Right. So that's how we got into it is because, yeah, we have the credentials. We're both former mm -hmm. prosecutors. Mm -hmm. We're certified by the New Jersey Supreme Court as criminal trial attorneys. Mm -hmm. um, and we're defense attorneys. Right. So right. we have the capability to really understand a lot of the legal issues that are in the press. Yeah. And it's so important. And we are so glad that we get to watch it and, and experience it and learn you know, you make it interesting to learn about this stuff. You know, regular people, we can learn about this stuff from you guys going on and doing the commentary. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, wh where can people go to find out more about you? Well, my firm's website is BianchiLawGroup.com. Okay. And then we have social media accounts, uh, LinkedIn, Google+, Facebook, okay. uh, and Twitter. Okay. On Twitter, my handle is DBrunoESQ. Okay. Uh, we also have a, U pay, a YouTube page with our videos and I've things that we I've seen all of that. Out. That is so great. Yeah. And on the website, there's all your cool, you know, interviews and commentaries and everything. Yeah, we so like to put fantastic. that stuff up there, you know, because okay. when somebody's coming and trying to find a lawyer, um, there's limited information that people have to yep. really make some very important decisions. Yeah, So absolutely. we try to highlight things. We try to get videos out there so that people could actually see you talk and argue yeah. and really make an intelligent decision when it comes to finding a lawyer. Yeah, well, thank you for being out there. <laughs> Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, and thanks for coming on. And we're going to wrap up now. Um, it went by so quickly. It did. <laughs> but um, I appreciate it. So thank you so much for coming on. And, thank you, um, you know, people will go to your website and everything. Thing. Sure. So, all yeah. right. We are wrapping up the Indie Lounge. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, to find out more about us, go to IndieLoungeTV.com. Follow us on Twitter at Indie Lounge TV and like us on Facebook, Indie Lounge TV. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, our sponsors, Flightline Financial, Lexer Capital Management, and Lighten Up Salon and Spa, along with our guest, uh, Mr. David Bruno. And I'm Mandy Del Rio, and I will see you next time on the Indie Lounge.